to talk about forest conservation and human health in Brazil. And I'm trying to show how we are using landscape perspective to do our research. So our main goal is to understand how landscape structure is related to the transmission of some zoonotic diseases. And to understand if there is a landscape structure that is considered health for people. Because if we are able to understand that, maybe we can manage landscapes in order to make them healthier for people in the future. So I'm going to show you two examples of what we are doing in Brazil. And the first one is about Hantavirus cardiopulmonary syndrome, or HPS, which is a disease that has a low number of cases per year, only 200, but has high mortality rates. So in Brazil, almost half of the people that get infected end up dying. So these rates are even higher in Brazil, and even higher in Sao Paulo states. And it is considered an agricultural disease because in Brazil, it is transmitted mainly by these two small rodents, the Nicromis lanzulus and the Oliborism gripis that are widely that, oh, that are widely distributed throughout Brazil. And uh, uh, a person to get infected, he, uh, she needs to breed the virus that is present in the urine and feces of the rodents. So it is considered that higher the abundance of the rodents of these reservoirs, higher higher will be the chance of contact between the, the, the person and the rodents, and higher will be the transmission risk for this disease. In order to the virus to, to be in the, in the environment, it's necessary to these rodents to have a minimal abundance. So the virus cannot keep the infection in the rodent population if they don't have a minimal abundance in the nature. So we decided first to look at the rodent population to see what is, what is predicting rodent abundance. And to do that, we collect the rodent abundance data in several landscapes of the Atlantic Forest of Brazil. And we saw that for this both rodents, the forest cover was the most important predictor. And we tested several other predictors as the number of fragments, type of crops, forest edge density, and etc. And we saw that higher the amount of forest cover lower the abundance of both rodents. And the only difference between these two species is the scale at which this variable was selected. So for the Necromis urus, the forest cover is important in a smaller scale than for the Oligorism nigritis. So for these species, the Oligorism nigritis forest cover is important in large scales and for necromis in small scales. So we can say that both species become more abundant in fragmented and degraded landscapes. So knowing that, we ask ourselves, what happens if we restore Atlantic forest areas? Can we actually diminish HPS transmission risk? So we extrapolate the abundance of these two rodents to the entire Atlantic forest, because we had the map, so we knew how much forest we have in the biome. Then we created a forest restoration scenario in which we considered that our forest code was respected. So in Brazil we have a forest code that regulates the amount of forest areas inside private properties. And it means that 53% of all forest areas are inside these private pro properties and are, are regulated by this forest code. But people don't respect this forest code, so there is a large deficit so in order to this forest code to be in compliance, is right there, people need to restore a large amount of forest areas. So in this uh, scenario, we just consider that our forest code was completely in compliance with the law set. And then we extrapolate the abundance again of both rodents to the to this new forest map and we created a map with the difference between both, both abundance. And we 
saw that for the Necromita virus, almost 40% of all the Atlantic forests present decreases in the abundance of these species, which you can see here in pink. And in 20% of the Atlantic forest, this decrease could reach up 44%, which I think is a lot. For the other species, the Oligoizulivitis, we can see that the maximum abundance in current forest conditions are 95 individuals per pixel, because here it is in pixel. After forest restoration, the maximum abundance is 10 individuals per pixel. So there is a large decrease in the maximum abundance of these individuals. So we don't know how is this minimal abundance that the population of rodents needs in order to maintain the virus and infect people, but we know that there is a large, a huge decrease in their abundance just by restoring forest areas. And we also see that 50% of the entire Atlantic forest, which is this red part in here, presented decreases in this species abundance, and in some parts this decrease could reach up 85%, which is a lot. For these species, 3% of the forest presents some increase in rodent abundance, but if we consider that for both species, 50% of the forest presented decreases in rodent abundance, we can say that restoring forest areas could diminish the transmission risk for this disease and could promote, uh, could promote disease regulation besides other important ecosystems. And it's a great thing to say to people that you need to restore forest areas, not only because you can bring more water or other stuff, but also because it's more healthy for people to have forests than other land use types. But when we look at the disease in humans, and we did that by using the number of HPS cases in humans, but using only the state of São Paulo and the 645 municipalities are landscape units. In a Bayesian model with seven uh, predictor variables, we, we saw that the forest areas are not so important. And that at least for this scale and for human cases, the sugar cane is the most important predictor. So we can say that, at least for São Paulo, higher the amount of sugar cane in a municipality, higher the chance of a person to be infected with HPS. So I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't restore forest areas, but I'm saying that we need to understand both aspects of this disease, or every disease, because we can diminish uh, transmission risk by decreasing rodent abundance, but we also need to understand what is putting people at risk for the disease. Because in order for a person to get infected, she needs to be in contact with the virus. And at least for HPS, it's sugarcane and in, in, in Sao Paulo. So if we are not able to manage like the, the sugarcane fields in Sao Paulo because they are huge and it's the main crop of the state and it's very economically significant, at least we can uh, implement educational campaigns and preventive measures, so we can try to the contact between this person, these, these humans and the virus. And looking at these both aspects, we can really diminish the, the transmission risk for this disease. And our second example is about the yellow fever virus that uh, affects around 200,000 people annually, but I think it's more, and takes around 30,000 people to death. Also has high lethality rate in Brazil. There is a, a, a vaccine, a vaccine for the disease, and in Brazil it is transmitted only by the wild cycle, which involves no human primates and avoidable mosquitoes. And in Brazil, these primates are so important that they, that they are used as sentinel events. So every time a dead monkey is found because of the yellow fever virus, 
the vaccination camp uh, campaigns are allocated in that place. So that's how the health authorities know that the virus is circulating in a location. So for this study, we are using the exact GPS point location of every monkey found that, that were confirmed for yellow fever virus, positive but also negative. In that way, we, we have the real presence and the real absence of the virus. And this data was collected in this outbreak that uh, Sao Paulo State is facing now. I don't know if you heard in the news, but we had 5,000 other monkeys that is this huge dead only in the state. And almost 1,000 people die, uh, dead by the disease. So it was our, uh, our worst outbreak by yellow fever since uh, 100 years ago. It was terrible. And we did a multi-scalar approach to, to try to understand how the landscape was affecting the virus presence. And we saw that higher the amount of agricultural areas and higher the forest edge density, higher the chance of the virus to occur. But we, what we are really interested in with the data is to see how the virus is dispersing through the landscape. So to, to do that, we are using only a subset of the data and on, only the howler monkey data, which is the most reliable data that we have. And we saw that, in average, the virus moves 1.4 kilometers per day but the largest distance observed was almost 7 kilometers per day, which is a lot for a virus. And the shortest 100 meters per day. But the majority of the movements occurs in distance that goes up to 1 kilometers per day. We also saw that the virus moves faster in the summer and lower in the winter. And that in most of the cases, within a week since the infection started. So it started in, in one point and in one week and in one week it goes to another point. In most of the cases that's what happened. And we tested 49, 49 hypotheses about how, how, how the virus is moving through the landscape and we saw that first he's using roads close to forest areas and forest edge areas composed by 100 meters of, of, of forest each side, close to water, agriculture, forest and road. So the virus is using these roads, close to forest areas, and these forest edges as corridors to, to, to move. And that large tracts of forest are, are more resistant to the movement of the virus. So we hope that with this model we can we can predict the movement of the virus for the next out, next outbreak and being advanced for the vaccination campaigns and avoid at least the human deaths that we could not avoid in these